In the small town of Sudbury, Ontario, Canada, 2022 proved to be a difficult year for the locals. Winter brought a sharp chill, and with it an unexplainable anxiety that hung in the air. The town, surrounded by endless forests and lakes, had always been quiet, but in early January, an event occurred that shook everyone up. At the center of attention was the White family, 46-year-old Gregory and 43-year-old Linda, a seemingly model couple with two children. Their 17-year-old daughter Emily was popular among her peers and excelled in school. Her younger brother Jason was two years younger and in his older sister's shadow, but the family seemed to be living a peaceful and prosperous life. Nothing foreshadowed tragedy. It all started on January 14th, when Emily suddenly went missing. Her absence became known in the evening, when she did not return home after school. Her parents raised the alarm only a few hours later. According to them, Emily might have stayed late at her friend's house, but by midnight, Linda started calling her daughter's friends who knew nothing about her. Half an hour later, at about 0045, Gregory called the police to report her missing. Officers arrived at the Wyeth's home around 1 a.m. The Wyeth said that in the morning, there was no sign of trouble. Emily had breakfast and left for school as usual. She was last seen at school around noon. At first glance, it looked like a typical missing teenager case that might have run away. Police didn't immediately perceive the situation as critical, but standard search efforts began. The next day, the search intensified. Police officers organized teams that checked local forests, schools, and parks. Social media and local news outlets quickly broke the news of Emily's disappearance, circulating her photo and calls for help. During this time, the White Home became the site of intense police interaction with the family. Linda and Gregory looked dejected, and their statements were confused. But this did not raise suspicion among the police. On the third day after the disappearance, doubt began to set in. Emily's friends began to talk about the strained relationship between the girl and her parents. Emily often complained about her mother's excessive control and strict punishments. However, according to friends, the father was more aloof and cold, although he never interfered in conflicts between mother and daughter. Classmates noted that in the weeks before her disappearance, Emily became withdrawn, skipped classes, and stopped participating in school activities. Despite the efforts of the police and local volunteers, on the fourth day of the search, no trace or clue to Emily's whereabouts was found. The police then decided to take the investigative step of searching the White's home. The officers reasoned that it was necessary to rule out the possibility that the girl might have left something in the house before leaving. Linda and Gregory agreed to the search, and a forensic team arrived at the house that evening. Nothing unusual was found during the inspection. Emily's room looked like its owner had left it in a hurry, but there were no obvious signs of struggle or violence. However, one of the units inspecting the area around the house came across a strange find. In a snowdrift behind the garage, police found a pair of winter boots covered in mud and snow. They were soon identified as belonging to Emily. This discovery changed the course of the investigation. Police began interviewing neighbors and acquaintances of the family in more detail. One neighbor stated that he saw Gregory White late in the evening of January 14th, walking through the backyard toward the garage. This fact raised new suspicions and drew investigators' attention to the family. They began to check the alibi of the parents and their actions on the day of the disappearance. The information that Emily often quarreled with her mother began to play an important role in the case. The investigators noticed that Linda was becoming increasingly nervous and agitated during the interviews. Her testimony about the last days before her daughter's disappearance began to disagree with what Gregory was telling her. Investigators soon noticed the discrepancy in the parents' accounts of the morning of January. On the fifth night of the investigation, police decided to conduct a second search, this time with the help of dog handlers. The dog led investigators to a shed in the backyard. Behind the wall, in a hidden hole, they found the body of Emily White. The girl had been strangled. The body was in a semi-decomposed state, indicating that the murder had occurred in the first few days after her disappearance. The discovery of Emily White's body shocked both the police and the public. Linda and Gregory were immediately detained for further questioning. During the interrogations, 
Linda began to lose her composure, faltered several times in her answers, but made no direct confessions. Gregory kept his cool, but could not explain why Emily's shoes were in the yard behind the garage. Investigators began to reconstruct the last days of Emily's life from the evidence found. Forensic examination showed that the girl was strangled by hands, and the marks on her body indicated that it was committed by someone who was physically stronger than her. It was not ruled out that the attack occurred in a state of passion. Meanwhile, Emily's cell phone, which was found in her room, contained several messages that she had sent to friends in the last days before her disappearance. In them, she complained about her strained relationship with her mother, who was increasingly controlling her life. Emily also mentioned that tensions were rising in the house and she felt trapped. The investigation revealed that Linda White was an extremely strict mother who demanded total obedience from her daughter. Emily, in turn, entered a difficult period of teenage rebellion, which only exacerbated the conflicts in the family. The final straw was Emily's decision to leave home, which caused an outburst of rage at Linda. Gregory apparently did not interfere with what was going on until the situation was out of control. The interrogations of the parents continued for several days. Under the pressure of evidence and witness testimony, and after the discovery of Emily's body, Linda White could not stand it and gave a partial confession. She claimed that on that day there had been another argument between her and her daughter that escalated into a physical confrontation. Linda insisted that she did not want to kill Emily, but in a moment of rage did not calculate the force. Gregory White, despite the fact that initially denied his participation in the crime, later admitted that he helped his wife to hide the traces of the murder. It was he who hid his daughter's body in the barn and tried to make it look like she had disappeared. Following the arrest of Gregory and Linda White, police began a more thorough examination of their family history. The investigation sought to understand what led to the tragedy and how events unfolded in those final days before the murder. At the same time, a wave of shock and bewilderment was spreading in Sudbury. For locals who had always considered the Wyeths to be a normal, even model family, their arrest came as a real shock. Detectives quickly realized that the story of Emily's disappearance was much more complicated than it seemed at first glance. The White family, living in a two-story house on a quiet street on the west side of town, looked perfect on the outside. But upon detailed inspection in and around the house, details began to surface that pointed to problems hidden from view. Initial findings by forensics revealed that Emily's body had been carefully hidden and all traces of the crime had been attempted to be covered up. When forensic investigators began a second search of the White House, they focused on parts of the building that had not been examined the first time. The basement, which appeared to be a regular storage area for old things, was of particular interest to the investigators. From the beginning of the interrogations, Linda claimed that she did not mean to kill her daughter, that it was an accident. However, the items found in the basement said otherwise. In one corner of the basement, a plastic barrel was found with signs that it had recently been attempted to be cleaned of traces of blood. This discovery led investigators to believe that Emily's death may have been planned rather than a random outburst of anger. Further examination revealed that Gregory, contrary to his initial claims of non-involvement, was actively involved not only in hiding the body, but possibly in the crime itself. On one of the work tables in the garage, police found evidence of recent repairs. Wood shavings and tools covered in bloodstains hinted that Gregory, being a master woodworker, may have tried to destroy the evidence using his professional equipment. Meanwhile, the psychologists working with Linda began to notice the instability of her mental state. Under the pressure of interrogation, she changed her testimony several times, contradicting herself. Initially, she said that the incident with Emily was spontaneous, caused by another quarrel. However, she soon admitted that a few days before the murder, she had begun to think about how to solve the problem with her daughter. Emily, she stated, had become a constant source of stress and anxiety for her, and the desire to control her daughter had grown into an obsession. The evidence began to gradually add up to one grim picture. From Linda's testimony and the investigative findings, it became apparent that the relationship between mother and daughter had been deteriorating over the past several years. Linda perceived any show of independence on Emily's part as a threat to her control over the family. This especially intensified after Emily reached adolescence and began to display her temper. 
which Linda felt could destroy their perfect family. Each day, Linda became more aggressive and controlling. Emily White's body, found in a barn, turned out to be more than just hidden. There were attempts to hide strangulation marks. On the girl's neck, forensics found small scratches and marks from a cord or wire, which indicated strangulation with the help of an external object. This disproved Linda's version of a spontaneous fight. Everything looked like a pre-planned action. Forensic experts concluded that Emily had been strangled in two stages, first with her hands and then with a cord, which made her death even more painful. Messages found in Emily's phone and data from her social networks completed the picture. It turned out that the girl had tried to run away from home a few months before the tragedy. She wrote to her friends about the tense atmosphere at home, and she could no longer tolerate the constant control and threats from her mother. Emily had even considered contacting the police or social services, but was afraid of the consequences. The police also discovered that Gregory White played as much of a role in the case as Linda. Interviews with Gregory's co-workers and testimony from neighbors indicated that he was not just turning a blind eye to what was going on in the family, but was actively supporting his wife. On several occasions, neighbors heard yelling coming from the White home, culminating in loud arguments between the parents and daughter. One neighbor even saw Gregory take Emily out of the house the day she disappeared, and she never came back. The investigation also revealed that in the days before the murder, Gregory and Linda began actively preparing to cover up the crime. They bought several large plastic containers and chemicals that were later found in the basement of the house. Apparently, the couple planned to dispose of their daughter's body in such a way that it would never be found. However, poor weather conditions and unexpected interest from neighbors disrupted their plans. This new information allowed the investigation to build a more accurate chronology of the events of that fateful day. According to surveillance footage, Emily did return home from school on January 14th. She spent several hours in her room, followed by a meeting with her parents, which led to her death. The exact circumstances of how events unfolded at the home were not yet completely clear, but police believed Linda started an argument that escalated into a violent attack on her daughter. Gregory apparently joined in later, helping his wife finish the job and hide the body. Meanwhile, the active trials of the Wyeths began in earnest. The couple was charged with first-degree murder, which implied a premeditated, premeditated crime. The Sudbury community watched in horror as events unfolded. Locals who had known the White family for years could not believe they were capable of such a brutal crime. The media covered the case with the utmost attention, and the White home became an object of intense interest, becoming a symbol of the tragedy that shook all of Canada. Parallel to the legal proceedings, discussions began in the city about the role of social services and their possible failings in the case. It soon became known that several years ago, the White family had already attracted the attention of the local guardianship authorities, but then no concrete action was taken. Emily apparently remained in the shadow of these systemic problems that prevented her from intervening in time to prevent a tragedy. At this time, Gregory and Linda White began their testimony in court. Linda, despite her initial confession, attempted to change her version of events, claiming that the murder was an accident. She reiterated that she did not mean to kill her daughter, but investigators and prosecutors had already gathered enough evidence to refute these claims. Gregory, on the other hand, continued to remain silent, refusing to testify in detail about his role in the crime. Despite Gregory's lack of testimony, the investigation continued to grow stronger due to the evidence found and witness testimony. One of the key points was that it was Gregory who assisted Linda in hiding the body and destroying evidence. He was spotted by neighbors near the barn the night after Emily's disappearance, indicating his direct involvement in the crime. The trial of Linda and Gregory White continued, and with each new session, the picture of the crime became clearer. Prosecutors sought to prove that Emily's murder had been planned in advance and that both parents had played an active role in the crime. The investigation focused on reconstructing the events of the day of the murder using the abundant evidence gathered over months of investigation. After analyzing evidence, including surveillance camera data and statements from neighbors, it became clear that the Wyeths began preparing to murder their daughter days before the tragedy. In the final weeks of Emily's life, tensions had been building in the home. 
the psychological pressure from Linda and Gregory began to intensify. Each day was marked by more frequent arguments and outbursts of aggression. An examination of family dynamics revealed several key factors that may have played a role in Linda and Gregory's motives. First, it emerged that Linda suffered from chronic stress related to controlling her daughter. Despite an outwardly prosperous life, Linda's internal state was deteriorating as Emily grew up and became more independent. This created an unbearable atmosphere in the family in which control and manipulation became Linda's way of managing her own anxiety. Gregory, as it turned out, not only did not oppose his wife's rigid behavior, but he himself seemed to be gradually drawn into her way of thinking. Despite his reserved nature and apparent outward calm, he supported Linda when she resorted to physical punishment of her daughter. His role as patron of the family was expressed in his desire to maintain an ostensible harmony, even if it required drastic methods. This psychological portrait of the White family became an important part of the prosecutor's prosecutorial strategy. One of the key points in the evidence is data from surveillance cameras installed near the White home. Footage from a camera located on the street showed Gregory White returning home on the day of the murder. He drove his car up to the house around noon, even though he said he was supposed to be at work at that time. This supported the investigator's theory that he intentionally left work to participate in the crime. Forensic analysis also played an important role in the case. Forensic experts confirmed that Emily had died from strangulation, and the marks on her body indicated that the murder had not happened instantly. Judging by the condition of the neck and internal injuries, the girl was struggling for life, which confirmed the premeditation of the action. The cord with which she was strangled was found at the crime scene with remnants of skin and hair, which became one of the main evidences. Emily's psychological state on the eve of her death was also analyzed. Her friends and acquaintances reported that she was experiencing a deep depression caused by pressure from her parents. The teenager tried to get her life together, but her mother's constant interference ruined her attempts to escape the family's control. Emily even considered running away from home, but did not have time to realize her plans. The investigation also relied on testimony from friends and acquaintances of the White family. One of the key witnesses was a neighbor who had seen strange things happening in the house several times in the days before the murder. He said that a couple days before the tragedy, he noticed Gregory and Linda loading large plastic containers into their car, which were later found in the basement. This discovery heightened suspicions that the couple had begun preparing to hide the body even before they committed the crime. In addition, the family's financial problems were uncovered, which may have served as an additional motive for the murder. In the final months before Emily White's death, the Wyeths were on the verge of bankruptcy. Gregory lost part of his income due to problems at work, and Linda, struggling to maintain her previous standard of living, fell into debt. The economic pressures added to the emotional strain in the family, and Emily became a kind of scapegoat for her parents, who blamed her for their failures. The Wyeths may have seen their daughter as an unnecessary burden that prevented them from coping with financial difficulties, and this only encouraged them to make a drastic decision. The investigation continued to reveal more and more shocking details. One of the most important episodes occurred when the police began analyzing the contents of Linda and Gregory's phones. In their messages in the days before the murder, there were clear indications that they had discussed possible scenarios for getting rid of Emily. Linda wrote to her husband about her fear of losing control of her daughter, that she could no longer tolerate her insubordination, and that something had to be done about it. Gregory's responses did not explicitly disagree, but only encouraged her to act, which increased the investigators' suspicions of their joint involvement. Along with the trials, public pressure was building in Sudbury. The city became a veritable battleground for discussions about how such a heinous crime could have occurred in a seemingly ordinary family. The local media constantly covered the trial, causing residents to become outraged and demand justice. People took to the streets with placards, demanding from the court not just punishment for the wits, but systemic changes in the work of social services, which, in their opinion, missed an opportunity to intervene and save Emily. Linda and Gregory's very legal defense was weak. Their attorneys tried to portray the crime as a random incident caused by anger, but ample evidence pointed to the contrary. The trial became increasingly tense, 
especially when experts testified to the planned nature of the couple's actions. The prosecutor's office filed a charge of first-degree murder, which implies a premeditated, premeditated crime. As the case progressed, new facts about the White family history were uncovered. It became known that a year before the murder, Linda had tried to seek help from psychologists, complaining about problems with her daughter. However, instead of trying to solve these problems through therapy, she increasingly focused on control and punishment. Gregory's role was also analyzed in the same context. At first, he seemed calm and even detached, but eventually his complete silence and lack of overt attempts to save his daughter from Linda's anger played against him. One of the most high-profile moments in the case was the day the court heard testimony from the detectives working on the case. They confirmed that since her arrest, Linda had tried to confuse the investigation by repeatedly changing her testimony. While in her initial interview she talked about an accident, she later began to claim that Gregory played a major role in the murder. However, the evidence pointed to her leading role in the crime, and Gregory only assisted in hiding the body and evidence. The forensic investigation took several months, during which time new details continued to emerge. One of them was an examination of the contents of garbage cans found a few kilometers from the White home. In them were found scraps of clothing and objects belonging to Emily, which confirmed the investigation's theory that the parents were trying to get rid of any traces related to the murder. Over time, the investigation built an increasingly cohesive picture of how the Wyeths planned and executed their daughter's murder. Prosecutors advanced the theory that Linda was the primary instigator of the crime, driven by her obsessive fears and desire to regain control of the situation. Gregory, despite his apparent passivity, played an important role in supporting his wife and in covering up the evidence. The trial of Linda and Gregory White was entering its final stages. Public attention to the case continued unabated, and the media continued to cover the proceedings on a daily basis. The prosecutors had finished presenting evidence, and now the White defense had to try to convince the court that what happened was not a premeditated murder, but a tragic accident. With each new fact, however, this became less and less likely. Key to the latter part of the trial was an examination of the financial and personal problems of the White family. The investigation presented evidence to the court that revealed another important detail. Shortly before Emily's death, Linda had been trying to get insurance money for her daughter. Although at first this may have seemed like normal family practice, investigators soon discovered that the amount for which Emily's life had been insured had increased dramatically in the months before her death. This fact only strengthened the prosecution's position. The parents had not just killed their daughter, they had prepared for it in advance. Witnesses invited by the prosecution continued to recount Linda and Gregory's strange behavior in the final weeks before the tragedy. Neighbors recalled how Linda had become less and less visible in public, her face often looking anxious, and Gregory had almost ceased contact with others, spending more and more time at home. One of Gregory's co-workers noted that Gregory had been unlike himself for the past month. He often complained about life, mentioned financial problems, but never once talked about his daughter. This detachment looked suspicious amidst all the other evidence. In addition, the family's financial difficulties reinforced the picture of desperation in which Linda and Gregory found themselves. The investigation revealed that their house was mortgaged to the bank, and if they could not pay off the debts in time, the family would lose their only home. At the same time, as it turned out, Linda actively tried to maintain the illusion of well-being in social networks posting photos from expensive restaurants and pretending that the family still lives in wealth. But this hid the bitter reality. The couple were barely making ends meet. It was financial difficulties, the prosecutor's office suggested. That could have been the decisive factor that drove them to kill their daughter. But most shocking was a new discovery while analyzing the Whites' cell phone data. Detectives found deleted messages in which Linda discussed with her husband possible ways to solve the problem with their daughter. In one of the messages, sent weeks before the murder, Linda bluntly wrote, We have to do something before it's too late. These words became key evidence of the premeditation of the couple's actions. However, the defense tried to refute the charges. Linda and Gregory's attorneys built their line of defense on the fact that the family had a complicated relationship with their daughter, that this was just a tragic outcome of years of conflict 
not a planned murder. They insisted that there had been an accident in the house that day. Gregory claimed that he had simply failed to stop Linda from crossing the line in time in a fit of rage, and that he had no intention of killing his daughter. A psychological evaluation conducted at the request of the defense also attempted to mitigate Linda's guilt, arguing that she was under chronic stress that pushed her to make inadequate decisions. However, these arguments did not find favor with the jury or the community. Too many facts pointed to the fact that the murder was deliberate and committed in cold calculation. In parallel with the main trial, the investigation into Emily's life, her surroundings and those who could testify that she lived under constant pressure from her parents continued. Emily's friends who testified said that she repeatedly complained about her mother, who controlled her every move. Although Emily tried to free herself from this pressure, Linda did everything she could to limit her freedom. In the last months before her death, Emily began planning to run away from home, and this could be one of the reasons why her parents decided to take such a drastic step. The final cord for the prosecution was the expert report on the marks on Emily's body. The forensic report stated that there were numerous bruises on the girl's neck, characteristic of strangulation. The force with which the trauma was inflicted indicated that it was not an instant strangulation, but a prolonged process, indicating a conscious intent on the part of the killers to finish the job. Evidence collected at the crime scene confirmed that both Linda and Gregory were in the room at the time of the murder, making them both involved in the crime. After all the evidence was presented, the court began deliberations. For several hours, the jury discussed the case, weighing all the pros and cons, but the outcome was predetermined from the beginning. The verdict was expected by everyone involved in the trial. Linda and Gregory White were found guilty of the premeditated murder of their daughter, Emily. The court ruled that their actions were cold-blooded and deliberate, designed to eliminate their daughter, who they felt had become a burden in their lives. Both parents received life in prison without parole. For those who followed the case, however, questions remained that were never clearly answered. How could an ordinary family from a suburban Sudbury home bring their lives to such a tragic end? What was the final straw that turned two parents into cold-blooded killers? The answers to these questions may not have been available to Linda and Gregory themselves or their lawyers. Emily White's death became a symbol of how hidden problems and inner conflicts can lead to irreversible consequences. The community was left shaken by the case, and after the verdict, discussions continued about the need for reforms in the social welfare system that could prevent similar tragedies in the future. Several months passed after the trial concluded, but the wounds from the case continued to bleed into the heart of the small town. Neighbors, acquaintances, and friends of the White family could not believe that such a tragedy could lurk behind the doors of an ordinary home. The people of Sudbury have long remembered this incident, which shook them to the core and left an indelible mark on the town's history. The story of Linda, Gregory, and Emily White was a grim reminder that even seemingly ordinary families can harbor dark and destructive forces.